Ahami's father reportedly warned police about his son two years ago, but an FBI assessment of the case ended after no ties to terrorism were found. Among other developments, authorities obtained a notebook that belonged to the bomber and reportedly exhibits opinions sympathetic to jihadist causes. After spending yesterday trading barbs with Hillary Clinton over how this nation should respond to such internal terrorist threats, Donald Trump stayed on offense at his rally this afternoon in High Point, North Carolina. Clinton was off the trail today, but held a conference call with some of her national security advisors, again taking aim at Trump's temperament and suggesting his rhetoric was helping terrorist recruitment. Mark, both campaigns are trying to use this incident to attack the other and gain the upper hand. Who at this moment has it? I hate to make people think this is a rerun, but I think we saw today pretty much what we saw yesterday. Both sides do think they can go on offense. I think the latest disclosures show this country needs to reexamine its procedures, but Congress has just as much culpability there as any president of the last two. And Hillary Clinton's trying to show that Donald Trump's unqualified. Donald Trump's trying to show that Hillary Clinton is insufficiently aggressive. Uh, for another day, I say both of them may need to keep talking about it because it's in the news, but I don't see anyone gaining advantage. I totally agree. I think it's a draw today. And, you know, I can't imagine that the past 48 hours listening to what the very predictable things that Trump has said about this issue and about Hillary Clinton and about him, about the broader array of issues that are raised here and the things that Hillary Clinton has said in response, mostly about Trump. I can't imagine that those things have done anything to move any movable voters, any available vote in either one of their in either one of their camps. Um, they're, they're probably doing a little bit to solidify the support they already have, but it does not seem to me that either one of them is gaining appreciably in this argument. I will say I find them both to be um, kind of hot on this issue, and obviously it's an emotional issue and it's an important issue, and both of them want to project strength. But my my gut feeling is that at least some people in the country would like to see a little bit more of an optimistic, a little bit more of a confident message about winning the war on terror, and not something that's so negative and so hot. Yeah, I think that's probably right. And you know, we talked yesterday about President Obama. You know, there are a lot of people who are critics of him. Uh, how he's handled the war on terror, but the one aspect of, is uh, the way he's handled it that I always find um, uh, a, a, a potent politically in some respects is to have that kind of calm demeanor and suggest that um, that this is a long this is a long battle and one where uh, calmness and rationality uh, may be the right cards to play. Yep. All right. Next topic. There have been plenty of recent polls suggesting the presidential race has tightened, but two surveys out today. Show good news for Hillary Clinton. A national poll from NBC News Survey Monkey has hit Clinton up five points in a two way, 50 to 45, amongst likely voters. Clinton has the same lead in a three in a four way race with the two third party candidates in the race. That is a wider gap than her two point margin in the same poll earlier this month. Monmouth University's got a Florida poll out today that has Clinton up 46 to 41 percent over Trump. Those are two polls that have been good for are good for Clinton. But before those polls, most of the recent ones have not been good for Clinton. They showed the race tighter and Trump ahead in some places. Brooklyn has been dishing out conflicting messages on just how nervous they are and how nervous they think their supporters should be for the final weeks of this contest. For instance, yesterday, Robbie Mook sent out a widely distributed fundraising email with the subject line, quote, the ways Trump can get to 270 electoral votes. His dire warning read in part, quote, Trump's path to the presidency is no longer a pipe dream. It is a it is clear and it is real. Yesterday, though, was also the day that Mook reportedly circulated a private 2000 word memo to donors that had a much different tone. It was aimed at curbing panic in the Democratic ranks about a close race. That memo noted the electoral map that makes a Trump presidency impossible unless he sweeps pretty much every battleground state and enlisted the numerous ways that Clinton could, with one or two wins, block any path Trump would have. So, John, which version of Robbie's reality is the real one? Well, uh, let's just let note this, that just like with debates, there's a lot of um, a managing of expectations and a lot of managing of emotions that go on uh, in both campaigns as we get down to the home stretch. And both of them are trying to play the Goldilocks game, right? You want to try to be, especially if you're the front runner, the one that the expected winner, as Hillary Clinton is the likeliest winner in this race, you have to, you want people to not be complacent, but you also want them to not be panicked. And so trying to find the right kind of not too hot, not too cold. I think, you know, the, the, the memo that Mook circulated yesterday uh, which shows Hillary Clinton with a lot more paths to 270 is closer to reality than the ones earlier when people were talking about a landslide for Clinton and they didn't want fundraising to dry up. And so they said, oh, no, Donald Trump could easily win the race.
And David Plouffe has told us and others that Trump has a 0% chance of winning. Mary Madeline said Clinton has pretty close to a 0% <laughs> chance of winning. So the answer lies somewhere in between. Look, I still think Trump has to win Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio before we can talk about a path for his to get to victory. If he wins those three, there's a couple ways he can do it. He's still the underdog, even if he can win those three. But I think that Brooklyn has to be serious about this. They're not as panicked as some of their supporters. But if Trump wins North Carolina, Florida, and Ohio, all plausible for him to do, then then Brooklyn has to worry because then their margin of error is, is greater than Trump's, but it's still a race that they could lose. Right. Um, okay. Now, David Fahrenthold strikes again. The Washington Post reporter who's been giving Donald Trump a headache by investigating his charitable foundation has a new story out, and it is a doozy. The latest report says that Trump spent more than a quarter of a million dollars from his nonprofit to settle lawsuits basically reaching agreements with people who were suing his private business by donating money to charity. Instead of using his own money, Trump reportedly gave those charities cash that other people had donated to the foundation. Mark, this story suggests that the Trump Foundation may have violated laws against self-dealing. There's another word for that, which is just slush fund. Uh, how big a deal could this maybe be? I'm not minimizing it. It's another case where he may have to pay fines and he may have broken the law. The most serious thing to me about this is Trump hired accountants and lawyers to deal with this foundation. And he's not an expert on the laws governing foundations, but I question the judgment he has in hiring people because the lawyers and the accountants that allowed this, I think, should lose their jobs. This is a, such bad judgment to do what this story says Trump did. He should not be, he should have points deducted from his capacity to offer himself to the country as a great leader and a great uh, manager if he hired people that incompetent. Dude, if this story is true, um, it, it, and the Pam Bondi story, which people still are, are reporting on and trying to figure that out, the pay-for-play implications, you got a slush fund a a allegation here, you got a pay-for-play allegation, or closer to a bribery allegation there. It suggests to me that the Trump Foundation, again, if these allegations are true, is way more corrupt on the face of it, way more corrupt than any allegation uh, than, than the Clinton Foundation is, right? We, we, a lot of people, I don't, you and I both I have, don't, I don't, have, you I and I both have issues with the Clinton Foundation and how it has done business. But these two stories, and this one in particular, are gratuitously corrupt. And we should, I think, hit really hard on the fact that this is a guy who seems to be running a charity in a way to advance both political and business interests yeah. rather than doing what charities are, in fact, supposed to do. Nonprofit. I don't want to. I don't want to minimize what's alleged in the story and what Trump seems to have done. It's horrible. It's 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 potentially illegal. It's bad judgment. And as I said, the people who did it for him, he should never have hired, and it reflects badly on him. But this doesn't involve the. This doesn't involve the government. He was not a government official. So I'm not sure corruption is the right word. But it is reckless, irresponsible, and selfish what he did. And as I'll say for a third time, someone who would hire accountants and lawyers who would either be that corrupt or that uh, dishonest, I should say, or, or that sloppy, I got to question their judgment as a leader. All right, up next, the gentleman from Georgia, David Perdue, senator from the Peach State. He's a supporter of Donald Trump, and he joins us next. Later in the program, the early voting ground games in the presidential battlegrounds, a deeper dive later on in the program. We'll be right back after this.
Joining us now, Senator David Perdue from the great state of Georgia. He has been a long and strong Donald Trump supporter. He joins us now from Capitol Hill in the Russell Rotunda. Senator, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you guys. Senator, tell me what you think the state of the presidential race is. Is Donald Trump favorite, underdog, or toss-up? Well, I tell you, I think he's touched the nerve in the electorate. I um, mean, you know, voter turnout was up over 60 percent this spring in the Republican primary. And I lived that same thing back in 2013 and 14 in my race in Georgia. And I think he's touched a nerve out there that's not going away. As a matter of fact, I don't, t I don't believe these uh, national polls right now either way. I think there's a lot of noise in the system. And quite frankly, a lot of the intensity behind Trump's support really doesn't show up in the polls. So I, I actually think he's got a chance to win this thing. I do think it's going to be close in some battleground states. But I think the high ground is the lack of performance of the Obama administration and the fact that Hillary Clinton is really offering no change in direction. And the people want that more than anything else. We were sold hope and change eight years ago, and neither happened. So when you say he's got a chance to win, can I take from that that you think he's still the underdog in this race? Well, look, I operated every day in my race as an underdog, and I know this guy. He's a fighter, and he's operating every day as if he is an underdog. But I tell you what, my prediction right now is he's going to win big. I, I really believe that this is bigger than Donald Trump. It was bigger than me. This is about the direction of our country. And people are now realizing that the direction that we're taking right now is failing. I mean, this is the weakest economic recovery in over 70 years. We've got right now the growth, GDP growth on a compound basis in the last eight years is under 1%. People are hurting out there, struggling to get from payday to payday. And a lot of times these polls, and the way we look at that in Washington is through the lens of the Washington establishment, sometimes misses that, and that I think is what's going on right now. Senator, you're a, a former CEO of a Fortune 500 company, right? Right. So today I'm going to ask you about a story in the Washington Post about Mr. Trump. Uh, which suggests that in the, his business, when he was facing some legal problems, yeah. that he agreed to make charitable donations to make those lawsuits go away and use money from his 501c3 charitable foundation to make those donations. Would, would, you, would, would you consider that proper behavior on the part of a, a private businessman? Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not sure I can accept the premise of the question. I mean, I, if, if those things were true and they go through a court and then he's convicted, obviously that's a problem, but that hasn't happened yet. You know, we've got the same thing on, on uh, Hillary's side with uh, she was in, an in a uh, government position taking personal advantage of, of a government position. So that, those are serious allegations. You know, the real issue right now, in my mind, is people in America want to see a direction for the country. They want to have hope again. And right now, right, we're not seeing that out of the Hillary campaign. I mean, honestly, we're talking about economic changes here that are increasing taxes, more regulation, smaller military. I mean, these are things that really bother people at a time when they see a crisis globally in this national security crisis, but also here at home economically. I mean, this debt is a very real right. issue right now. We're, we're seeing no solutions from, uh, from the Hillary camp. Well, Senator, I'll stay, with, I'll stay with that point. I know you're a deficit hawk and you don't like the debt. You just mentioned that a second ago. There's not a, yeah. a single nonpartisan analysis of Donald Trump's tax plan that doesn't suggest that it would add trillions of dollars to, to the national debt. So um, just make the case for why the Trump tax plan is acceptable to a deficit hawk like you. Well, I tell you what, I, I'm excited about it as a first step. I, if you get this economy going, that's one of four or five things that has to happen. And what he's talking about is tax reform, pushing back on regulations, and unleashing this energy boom that we've been given are great first steps. I'd love to see us move to a repatriation tax elimination as well, but we've got to deal with redundant agencies, we've got to deal with saving Social Security and Medicare, and arresting the spiraling nature of health care costs that I think he will begin to address in this campaign. So I think as a first step, I'm very excited about it. Senator, whether you've given private advice to the campaign or not about the debate, give us some advice here publicly. What should Donald hey, Trump don't change do? The thing. In, what should he do you know, to win I, the I debate? I don't think he's, yeah, I don't think he's, he's changing anything. I think right now if he uh, goes in there and takes the high ground that he's taking right now, and that is to address the failures of the Obama administration, to talk about the fact that Hillary Clinton is going to double down and give us a third term, and frankly, talk about the hopes and aspirations of America and how they've been disappointed, how the, the liberal progressive movement of, of a Barack Obama administration and now of a potential Hillary Clinton administration have failed the very people they claim to champion. If he does that, it doesn't matter what the questions are, he'll come out on top on Monday. Give us an example of a question you'd like to see Lester Holt ask Hillary Clinton in the debate. How do you put people back to work? She's got no experience doing that. He's hired tens of thousands of people, created thousands of jobs in the real world. That's what I ran on. 
Look, he's had not a perfect career. Nobody has a perfect career, but I'll tell you what, he's had to survive in the free enterprise system. He knows how to fight. He knows how to fight for people, and he said that. I want an American president to stand up for national interest and American interest and create a level playing field around the world, both in a national security perspective, but also in an economic perspective, and he'll do that. And I think that's going to become clear as we go through the next seven weeks. You know, guys, it's seven weeks from today. Yep. As hard as that is to believe, but uh, I'm optimistic that you're going to see this intensity that's behind the uh, Trump campaign grow over the next few weeks. The ground game is taking force uh, in my state and other states, and I think North Carolina, New Hampshire, Senator, Colorado, you're going to see a lot of increased activity there. I, I got one last question for you, Senator. Just I know you've expressed some disappointment that your fellow Republicans have not uh, unified more fully behind uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, just what do you think explains that? Why is it that? Uh, the party is not unified and why there are so many holdouts and critics of, of the party nominee. Well, I hate to be blunt, but I think it's self-interest versus natural interest. We've got an, a, a stark contrast in two different directions offered by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I don't understand any Republican, any conservative Republican, thinking that a direction of Hillary Clinton would be better than a direction of Donald Trump. It's time to really put our big boy pants and big girl pants on and step up and tell the American people a better way. And that's what they're hoping for in the next seven weeks. Senator Perdue, gentleman from Georgia Center, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, guys. When we come back, we'll get schooled by the president of the National Education Association. After this, brief and enjoyable recess. Back class, we're taking attendance, and here on set is the president for the National Education Association and a Hillary Clinton supporter, L Lily Eskelson Garcia. Did I get that right? Not right, Lily? So close. Eskelson. Es That's Eskelson. It. You got it. You got it. It's close. I was in the ballpark, right? Good, good phonics. Okay, so here's the thing. I know you're a big Hillary Clinton supporter, but let's just like start with education, right? Like the, on the on the issues that matter to school reform to education across the country. Why is it that Hillary Clinton is your choice and what's wrong with what Donald Trump has said about this issue? Well, we don't have enough time to really okay. go into the breadth of what's wrong with Donald Trump taking millions and millions of, of existing dollars from the uh, existing education budget, which is special education, Title I, reading tutors, that kind of thing to give to private schools. 
not a good idea. But for Hillary, you take a look at where she started her career. She started her career as a young lawyer saying, I'm going to fight for the rights of poor kids who weren't receiving the special ed uh, um, services that they deserved. She has fought for special education, for preschool, for affordable college, for our dreamers. You name it, she's really put families right. and communities and kids and their education um, access first. So understood, understanding that she has a biography that you find appealing, and obviously uh, it's not that surprising that uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that the NEA would be on the side of a Democrat. What is, what's one idea that she's put forward in terms of education reform that you think is, is uh, new and important? One of the things that really appealed to us about um, Hillary Clinton, when I was talking to her about her plans, what are your priorities, what, 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 do you, what would you do for public education, she gave me the best answer I have ever received from any politician. I ask them that question all the time. She answered with a question, and she said, what are teachers saying? What's getting in their way? What is it that's an obstacle? What do they need to really move ahead? Can you put together some uh, third grade teachers for me? I wanna talk to them. She said, I have a lot of ideas, but I won't know if they're good ideas or bad ideas until I talk to the people who actually know the names of those kids. I went, love you that was I mean that was to have a politician at that level say I'd talk to a teacher before um, I would think about uh, pushing some kind of policy that was what was was that's what gave us no child left untested for 14 years a bunch of uh, well-meaning politicians who never asked that third grade teacher what are the unintended consequences she did I know Hillary Clinton is a big supporter of you and your organization, and you're a big supporter of her, but is there any issue you know of where Hillary Clinton and the NEA disagree? You know, I, I was just captured by her saying, you will always have a seat at the table. I don't expect that having three teachers in the same room, that three teachers are going to agree on exactly right. but are there what any, to do. Are there, any big, are there any big priorities or issue positions of the NEA that you know that Hillary Clinton doesn't agree with you on? In every single education issue, from affordable college to preschool to kids having to have the wraparound services that they need, she's with um, America's kids, she's with our families, and she's with us. So the answer is no. You agree? She agrees with you on everything, right? She, no, you know. there, there, are, there are so many issues out there and so many ways to get to the goals. She has agreed with us on every goal that we've talked about for our students. Okay. I know, I know you, you're pretty negative, to say the least, about Donald Trump, and I know you're also very optimistic about America and the American people. I just want you to reflect on the reality that Donald Trump will almost certainly get at least 40% of the vote in this election and maybe substantially more. What does that say about giving your view of Donald Trump about the country now? That's a very good question. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of analysis and a lot of books written about the Trump effect, about um, people actually um, rallying to a message that can be so hateful and so divisive. Um, we're actually seeing that sometimes in our schools now, where uh, kids are um, bullying other kids because of their ethnicity or the, a, a little girl who's wearing a headscarf, where there's studies being done on, on that as well. Um, we're looking at role models when we look at candidates. Our children are watching, and they're watching um, this campaign. I think it's frightening some of them. Let me ask you this question, given, uh, given what you just said, and again, as Mark suggested, uh, you're, a very, you're a pretty harsh critic of Donald Trump. Um, a lot of people have assumed that the Hispanic vote would be, Hillary Clinton would do very well with Hispanics. She seems to be doing pretty well in terms of the percentage that she's attracting, but there is now a pretty widespread sense that uh, perhaps there is not the same level of enthusiasm for her candidacy that among Hispanic voters, especially younger Hispanic voters that were as expected by the campaign and that Barack Obama had. So what explains that? Why are Hispanic voters not more, uh, not more into Hillary Clinton? I look at the people in my, in my circle of influence and it's pretty 
solid with Hillary. So I think you're going to be looking at polls. I think you're going to be looking at a lot of things that change over the course, depending on what the um, t um, articles in the newspaper today but are. Not, but there's not that much time left in the election. Donald Trump has said a lot of things that are really offensive to a lot of Hispanics, right? Mm -hmm. That's the case. Oh, yeah. she's, and she's a champion for a lot of traditional uh, issues like immigration reform. So how can it be at this point that Hispanic enthusiasm is problematic? Even the campaign acknowledges that right now, that is one of the problems they face. Well, I think this has been such a negative campaign that it's turned off a lot of people on politics in general. Uh, there are a whole lot of folks that just are, are um, tuning it all out because it's so overwhelmingly negative. But election day is 49 days away. And one of the things the National Education Association is going to do, and three million of our members who understand how important it is who sits in that office, who sits in, in your governor's office, your Senate, your school board races, we're going to be out there with a ground game. Okay. We are going to be out there knocking on doors and making sure people hear from us why we're supporting Hillary Clinton. Listen to this. I'm going to get it right right now. Lily. Eskelson Garcia. Very nice. Thank you for coming on the show. When we come back, the great debate expectations game. Who is winning after this? And once again, the nation is now wrestling with the fallout of some more footage showing an unarmed African-American man killed by a white police officer. This case comes from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where 40-year-old Terrence Kircher was fatally shot Friday night after police responded to reports of a stalled vehicle. Videos of the incident released by the police yesterday, and they appear to show Kircher with his hands up before he falls to the ground. The officer who fired her gun is claiming Kircher was not cooperating with authorities on the scene today. Hillary Clinton went on the Steve Harvey radio program and called the incident, quote, unbearable and intolerable. So John, we've seen shootings like this, of course, many times over the last few years. It's become a campaign issue at times. Do you think in this moment in the campaign, 50 days to go, that it will this incident or others like it could become a dominant issue and how will Clinton and Trump deal with it if it does? Well, look, we, we saw this not that long ago, Mark. You, you will well recall back in July when we had these two, the, the incidents that took place in Baton Rouge and in Minneapolis where we were yesterday. Um, and those issues, those, those incidents still haunt those communities at this point. And, and they became a focal point where they dominated the news for several days when there were two of them. And then there was also the shootings obviously the, the, in, in Dallas that came at the same time. So uh, the, the individual instance, this one is pretty horrific on the base of the videotape, but 
Given how inured a lot of the country sadly has become to these issues, it often takes more than one to really break through. And in this instance, Hillary Clinton's addressing it uh, in the way that she's addressed a lot of these issues, this, the, a lot of these shootings in the past. Uh, Trump so far seems to be ignoring it. Um, it seems to me that this, this one may not catalyze a giant debate, even though it should. Yeah, the national and local press must always cover these cases, and, and I believe the consciousness has been raised amongst the media that these cases must be covered, whether they're protests or not, whether there's some new angle on it or not, they must be covered. And the candidates need to address it. I'm glad Hillary Clinton did. I suspect Donald Trump might or should, and he certainly should, but the reality is, as we get closer to Election Day, the bar for stories breaking through for the candidates to talk about them becomes pretty high. It takes something like the terrorist attack that we saw over the weekend for the campaigns to sort of shift the message that they're on. And that's just a reality. And it'll become more and more difficult for anything to get attention except the very biggest things yeah. until after Election Day. Yeah, this is a pretty big thing. But as I say, they become sadly all too common. And so um, it's, they're also sadly easy for people to not focus on to the extent they should. Anyway, let's also talk about a different story. Uh, that thing a Kennedy is saying, a Bush is saying about a Clinton. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, the daughter of Robert Kennedy, posted a photo of former President George H.W. Bush to Facebook yesterday, along with these eight words, quote, the president told me he's voting for Hillary, with two exclamation points. A spokesman for Bush 41 said that the former president's vote will be private. So, Mark, my question for you is, if George Herbert Walker Bush is, in fact, voting for Hillary Clinton, does that and will that matter? You know, it's getting a lot of attention today. I think most people assumed that at least some of the Bushes were going to vote for, vote for her. Um, surprising, though, I mean, obviously he didn't say it on camera and the Bush folks are being quite about it. It's not causing quite the, getting quite the attention I thought it would. And you and I have discussed this, John. The Clinton campaign, I think, realizes that pushing Republican support may not be in its interest anymore right. uh, for all sorts of reasons, including it depresses Democratic turnout. And right now, getting Democrats enthusiastic is important. Getting endorsements from the Bushes may not be the best way to energize the Democratic base. Right. I mean, this summer we saw it, right, when... Uh, Hillary Clinton was trying to basically say Donald Trump is an abnormal Republican and that there's space for normal Republicans to come to her side. She ruled out a lot of Republican endorsements, and I thought that they, had, they would have some big Republican endorsements up their sleeves, whether it might be this Bush or maybe even George W. Bush coming to her uh, side by the end of the fall. Uh, I now agree with you, though, that if they ever had that plan, they may not be rethinking that plan because they need a lot more energy on the Democratic, in the Democratic base than they currently have, and th this is not the way to get it. Yeah. And the Bushes don't just represent the Republican Party. They also represent the establishment. Right. And right. we've long seen that if Donald Trump's got a chance to win this election, and he clearly does right now, it's because he's the anti-establishment candidate. And I think it's easy for Trump to go out to working class areas, say in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and say, hey, the Clintons and the Bushes who've owned the White House are ganging up on me. Do we want more of the same that the Bushes and the Clintons brought you? Right. Or do we want to go in a different direction? So I'm not sure if, if, if George Bush, either George Bush offered to stand with Hillary Clinton for an endorsement at this point. I'm not 100 percent sure, unlike a few weeks ago, that they'd take the opportunity. Yeah, and look, and not only is it true the thing you just said about them, them being establishment, but they don't even have that much purchase, real purchase, I think, even with moderate suburban Republicans anymore. The Bush name, just as Jeb Bush proved, the Bush name is just not worth what it used to be. Yep. All right, first presidential debate, of course, less than a week away, which means that both the candidates and their campaigns are making their final efforts now to set expectations. Take, for instance, Donald Trump last night on The O'Reilly Factor. If she treats me with respect, I will treat her with respect. It really depends. People ask me that question. Oh, you're going to go out there and do this and that. I really don't know that. You're going to have to feel it out when you're out there. And I can talk about her deleting emails after she gets a subpoena from Congress and lots of other things. I mean, I can talk about her record, which is a disaster. I can talk about all she's done well, I to expect, help ISIS I expect you'll do that become anyway, the terror though, that right? they become. And I will be doing that. So, I mean, we're going to go back and forth. And she's got a lot of baggage. I'll tell you what. She's been there a long time. All right, and here's what Hillary Clinton told Jimmy Fallon last night about the unpredictability of Trump. Which Trump are you going to get? Do you have any idea what, because he seems to be changing a bit. Uh... Well, look, he's trying to somehow convince people to forget everything he's said and done, you know, and I don't think that he's going to get away with that. At <laughs> least, uh, you know, judge us on who we are, what we've done, what we've stood for. 
Um, and Maya Angelou has this great line. You know, I admired her so much. I was fortunate enough to get to know her. She said, when someone shows you who he is, believe him the first time. So, John, both candidates are talking about what they expect, what they plan to do, what they don't plan to do, trying to set the table. As we get closer, they're also going to be trying to play down their own expectations. So who's winning the pre-debate skirmishes right now? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, look, I, people, I think, are so set on what they think. We've discussed this a few times now. I think that elite opinion assumes Hillary Clinton's the better debater, and so she's going to be the favorite. I think among... Uh, the, among the, the, the average voters, I think a lot of Trump supporters think that, that, that Trump is going to clean Hillary Clinton's clock and vice versa on the Democratic side. I'm not sure any of this expectation setting is going to matter at all this time because this is such an unusual debate with so much expectation and such huge high profile combatants. I reserve the right to change my mind before Monday, but I'll say this. I think one thing that's working in the Clinton campaign's favor, and they've subtly set the, laid the groundwork for this, is to try to get the media to judge this not as a crazy, unorthodox contest where the old rules of judging debates goes out the window, but to judge it by normal standards. And I think they feel confident that if the debate is judged by the normal standards of way a presidential candidate a debate is judged, th they have a much better chance of, of Clinton doing well. That doesn't mean that you know the, the the normal standards are all that healthy for democracy but i think they'll be fine they'll be comfortable if it's judged the normal way which is a lot about theater criticism a lot about gas and a lot about big moments i think they're fine with that they don't want trump though to be judged by some trump standard i ask you this question though this is a little bit off topic but i'm still interested in your answer because i actually don't know what you think about this what, what is the, do you think that the that the moderator should do fact checking in real time if donald trump lies gratuitously on stage misstates his position is it their job to step in or do they have to leave that to hillary clinton to do that job i think they should break the rules and let the candidate get in if the candidate wants to fact check the other side i think that's what they should do i don't think the, the moderator should do it okay i'm uh, i'm still thinking that one through i haven't really made up my mind but uh, i'll get around to it before monday for sure up next early voting is about to begin. We will talk about the ballot math before Election Day when we come right back. As we get closer and closer to Election Day, two of our colleagues here at Bloomberg Politics are counting up votes in key battleground states for their ongoing eight-part series that we're calling Battlegrounds 2016. This week is all about early voting. We are joined now by Bloomberg Politics contributor Sasha Eisenberg and little Steve Yacino. 
who is a producer on this show. It's hard to tell which of you is smarter, more handsome, or shorter. Um, tell us about your project this week, Sasha. Uh, you're talking about this is all about early voting. Yeah. What's the, what's so the deal? Once again, we worked with Clarity Campaign Labs to dig into the voter file, to look at individual voters and count them up. Early voting begins this Friday in Minnesota. People can begin voting. It's basically six weeks of Election Day. More than a third of the electorate will, will vote before Election Day. And it really changes the strategy and tactics that candidates need to, to get to their win number in, in these battleground states. All right. So uh, just like let's focus on, on Trump for a second and, and think about kind of what the stakes are here. Everyone assumes, that obviously, the Clinton campaign has more of an infrastructure and more of a capacity to move on early voting. Where, where's Trump in this game? Yeah, Trump's obviously very reliant on state parties through the RNC. Um, spent some time in Ohio looking at their, you know, this is a, the Ohio Republican Party knows how to uh, get to its voters in the, in the early vote period. The day that you send in a request to the Secretary of State, they, the state party already has your, your name going to a, a direct mail vendor. The goal is that you get a, a piece of mail, and if you haven't returned your ballot after 10 days, they chase you down for it. I think the challenge for Trump is going to be they know how to turn out people who are going to vote for the Republican ticket, but Trump's math in some of these states is going to require eating into the Democratic base, and the Republican parties may not know how to mobilize those voters during the early vote period. That's true in Ohio? I think it'll be a challenge in Ohio. You know, I mean, they, there's a big Republican ticket in Ohio. Obviously, we talk about the Senate race, but they are concerned down to county offices with turning out Republican voters. And some of the, the, the Trump voters we talk about, Eastern Ohio, um, might be voting for Democrats the rest of the ticket, but voting for him at the top. Steve, talk about the Democrats in the early voting. What are the stakes on that side for Hillary Clinton? Yeah, so like, like Sasha said, we're going to see really the disparities between these two uh, campaigns when it comes to infrastructure. And Hillary Clinton has the larger infrastructure. She's got staff all over the country. And uh, in particular, Iowa is going to be a key state where we can watch her, in part, in part because Iowa is a state not there's the amount of early votes there is not the largest in any state in the country but it's one of the earliest it starts next week and so what we're going to see is we're going to see uh, Hillary Clinton try to turn out her uh, more unreliable voters in Iowa that she really needs to win because when you look at the math in Iowa and other states Republicans really do have a larger base. The, we, the reason Democrats win those states is because they're able to, to reach out and turn out more unreliable voters. This is who we're talking about when we talk about the, the Obama coalition. And if she can do that, then she can win states like uh, uh, Iowa, Nevada, and other ones. Um, but she's going to need a head start, and, and Democrats have been historically better at turning out early voters than Republicans have. Steve, uh, Sasha, rather, now, North Carolina is an incredibly interesting state because it's got a diverse electorate, a changing electorate. Obama won it, President Obama won it once, but Governor Romney won it. Talk about what the situation is there. Yeah, 57% of North Carolinians voted early in, in 2012. Um, and Democrats have done a good job of getting African Americans to move up their uh, uh, voting to early in the voting period, which is which is why the recent court decisions overturning some of the uh, uh, election reform laws are important there. What we could see, Hillary Clinton's path to victory in North Carolina relies on um, could rely on just mobilizing the existing Democratic coalition. If she does that successfully in the beginning of the early vote period, she can know by late October that she basically has a state in the bag and start to move some of her persuasion spending to, to other states where she, she wants to be more competitive with persuadable voters. Okay, so another state that you guys looked at, and I'll, this will be a jump ball. You guys can fight it out for who answers this, is Nevada, where I just was last week I'm kind of amazed about the, this state has been a pretty safe Democratic state, in fact, for the last two cycles, and now there's polling that shows Trump ahead. When you factor in the early vote, tell us what's going on there. Yeah. Nevada is actually a big early voting state. They, there's a, it's a smaller window. It's about two and a half weeks. But uh, they've, been, they've been really good at turning out a lot of voters in that time. In that condensed period, 62% of uh, voters in 2012 uh, voted early. Those are voters who are still on the rolls now. And so the, thing, the, what that, the reason that matters is because if Donald Trump is going to win those states, he's going to have to turn out persuadable voters. He has less time to do that. And as of now, Donald Trump isn't on the air in Nevada. And so Hillary Clinton is trying to make a play for those persuadable voters. And we, we have yet to see Donald Trump really go there, as a traditional campaign would, and try to convince them. I'm going to ask you, like, the dumbest question in the world, and I, I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm not the dumbest person in the world, but I'm going to pretend to be someone who doesn't, Force really, under, someone who doesn't really understand this at all, okay? Why do we, if you're, if you're a candidate, why do you care whether someone votes early or votes late? Well, so it depends who you 
so there are different ways of approaching this, and we see it in different states. Some campaigns say, let's clear out our most reliable voters early so that as time goes on, we can reach into the more difficult parts of the electorate to mobilize people who are unreliable voters or, or, or persuade. Uh, others see it the other way, which I think is a story we sort of see in, in Iowa, where we have a long period. Let's use the early period to go to people who are not reliable Election Day voters and let them take advantage of the convenience of voting early. Um, Part of it depends on the composition of the electorate in these states. I think what we will see, this is the challenge you see in Nevada, um, is that Trump's sort of late start both on the airwaves for persuasion and on the ground for mobilization means that his sort of strategic path, he's going to have fewer options as you get closer to Election Day. But th this is one of the great debates that happens among campaign tacticians now is if you have a month to turn out voters, right. what sequence do you want them to vote in? Right. The whole question of, you know, like I mean, the, the, the notion of like, let's bank some votes makes a lot of, you know, it's always nice to bank some votes, right? But kind of what the sequence and, and these questions seem like really important tactical decisions you have to make about like what, what you're banking, when you're banking it, and where you're putting your shoulder in. In, in, in competitive states, if you can bank enough votes early and you feel like you have a good handle on that state, you can pull out, you can divert resources to another state you really need to win. You are a smart kid, you see now? Sasha, you're both great. Battleground 2016, a weekly series from now till Election Day. Every and Tuesday. Every Tuesday, these guys here being really smart, uh, and we're going to play the Victory Lab uh, animation next week because I love that thing. Uh, read up all about it, the whole detailed thing on BloombergPolitics.com right now. Coming up, we're going to hear what it's like to run for vice president from two people who know the process all too well. Interviews with Dan Quayle and Joe Lieberman right after this. And, of course, if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. As the health of both presidential candidates came under scrutiny last week, new attention turned to their running mates, who would be just one tragedy away from the executive seat if the ticket gets elected. We talked about this topic on The Circus, our show on Showtime. We do in conjunction with Bloomberg Politics this past episode on Sunday. For that episode, our co-host Mark McKinnon sat down for conversations with two men who know from the scrutiny that comes with being number two, former Vice President Dan Quayle, who of course served under George Herbert Walker Bush, and Al Gore's 2000 running mate, Joe Lieberman. Because Hillary Clinton got sick this week and had to go off the trail, it shined a spotlight on the importance of the role that the vice president plays as the one who is just a heartbeat away from the presidency. How are you? Mark McKinnon. Great to meet you. How are you, Mr. Vice President? 
How are you, friends? Good, Good to see, see you. <laughs> You know, there's always a lot of jokes about the vice presidency that come through our history. The one of the oldest is about the two brothers. One went off to sea, uh, the other became vice president, and neither was ever heard from again. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's much more than that. Can you tell us what it was like uh, when you got the call and you learned you're going to be the vice presidential nominee? I was walking back to the hotel, and we had beepers in those days. We didn't have cell phones. The beeper went off, said the call was coming in, so I get back to the hotel, given it a phone number, and um, they, I call it, and I get Jim Baker. I go, oh, darn, I've lost. Expecting to get bad news? Well, I, yes, because I was expecting the vice president, George Bush, to call me. Ah, okay. So when it was Baker, you assumed it was Baker, worse. Baker, I assumed it was worse. So he says, here, hang on for uh, the Veep, which is, you know, he was vice president at the time. So the vice president gets on, he says, I'd like to offer you officially the vice presidency. I said, honored, thrilled, I'll, I'll be there. I said, what's my assignment? He says, you need to show up at the Spanish Plaza at 4 o'clock, and this is 2 o'clock. I said, well, where in the heck is the Spanish Plaza? He says, I don't know. He says, but this is your first assignment. Don't, don't, <laughs> Figure it out. Don't screw it up. <laughs> One of the first calls I get is from uh, President Nixon. He says, you know, I was about your age when Eisenhower picked me. Let me just tell you, he says, your life has changed forever. Most people say that when you're making this decision, the foremost consideration must be who has the capacity, ability, experience to step into the presidency. Ultimately, the, the person that the presidential nominee chooses has to pass the most important test, which is the American people will think he or she are capable of being president. Tell me a little bit about w what it was like to figure out that you were on the short list yeah. in 2000. Right. Toward the end, it was down, interestingly, to John Kerry, mm -hmm. John Edwards, yeah. and me. Wow. And the money, the, the smart money over the weekend seemed to be that it was going to be John Edwards. Warren Christopher apparently said uh, to Al Gore, Mr. Vice President, this selection will say more about you than it does about the person you're selecting to be your running mate. And if you select Senator Edwards, you will have to explain to the American people why you're taking a person who two years ago was practicing law in North Carolina and you're putting him second to the most powerful uh, governmental position in the world. And apparently that turned the conversation. Can you tell me what it was like when, serving as vice president when he got sick at the Japanese dinner where he's incapacitated? I get a call from Sam Skinner about 4 o'clock in the morning. And he says, we've had a problem in Tokyo. The president, he passed out at uh, dinner. 30 seconds later, Barbara Bush is on the line. I said, Barbara, what the heck's going on over there? She says, oh, he overdid it. He said, I told him not to play an extra set of tennis. He's fine. He's got the flu. She said, don't worry about it. Because she was the real second in command, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do the voters have a right to know what the status of the candidate's health is? I think uh, candidates have a responsibility to reveal their, their baseline health condition. I've always been for disclosure, but it's not as important as the media makes it out to Right. Be. What's it like to be an ex-vice president? It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to former Vice President Dan Quayle and former Senator Joe Lieberman. You can catch the circus every week on Showtime Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern. John and I will be right back.
Pick up your closest screen and head to BloombergPolitics.com right now. You can check out our fancy new poll decoder where we break down the polls. We show you a detailed picture of which demographic groups support which candidates for president. It's fascinating. Highly recommend it. On Bloomberg West, great Emily Chang talks self-driving cars with National Highway Safety, Chains, Safety Administrator Mark Roskin. Tom until tomorrow, thanks for watching. <laughs> Sayonara. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg West. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. In his final address to the United Nations General Assembly, President Obama today called for, in his words, a course correction for globalization. The president urged those countries and leaders who believe in democracy to, again quoting, speak up forcefully. That doesn't mean democracies are without flaws. It does mean that the cure for what ails our democracies is greater engagement by our citizens, not less. In a less than subtle jab at Donald Trump, the president said, quote, the world is too small for us to simply be able to build a wall and prevent extremism from affecting our own societies. The father of the New Jersey and New York bombing suspect reportedly told the FBI in 2014 his son was a terrorist. Ahmed Khan Rahami's father told the agency his son was interacting with, quote, bad people overseas. He later recanted those claims. The U.N. has suspended all con Convoys in Syria after airstrikes on aid trucks killed at least a dozen people. Just hours earlier, the Syrian military said a truce brokered by the U.S. and Russia had failed. France has arrested eight people in connection with the July truck attack in Nice that left 86 dead. Prosecutors say the suspects are linked to the attacker who was killed by police. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. Bloomberg West is next. Up, the U.S. government paves the way for driverless cars to hit the road. We'll hear from government and industry experts about where innovation goes from here. Plus, Adobe shares are popping on higher demand for the company's cloud software. We'll bring you all the key numbers. And is India Oracle's next frontier? CEO Safra Kath tells us about her ambitions for that fast and growing market. But first, to our lead, the U.S. government is paving the way for automated vehicles to hit the open road. A framework released by the highway regulators on Tuesday says cars...